Good morning, beloveds. Wow. I am here to share our reading for this morning. It is from our book of the month, Creating a World That Works for All by Sharif Abdullah. And this morning, our reading speaks in metaphor. Put on your spiritual metaphorical ears. From page 150, The Sword and the Path. The people of a mythical old town find it necessary to cut a path to a new town. Some residents are sharpening their long swords. Each edge is already finely sharpened, but still they hone them. Each day they are at their wheels, grinding away at their blades, refining their swords even further. After they get their blades to a microscopic sharpness, they sharpen even further. To the suggestion that they actually use their swords to cut a path to the new town, they reply, we're not ready. Our swords are not sharp enough yet. In another place in the old town, another group of people is actually blazing a path to the new town. They are hacking through the underbrush. It's slow and tedious, dangerous mainly because their cutting blades are dull, rusted, and in some instances, even broken. Many people tear at the underbrush with their bare, bleeding hands. They curse the slow going, the torturous pace. To the suggestion that they take a little time to sharpen their swords, some say, what swords? Others protest, what good would that do? Anyway, this job is too important to take time to sharpen our blades. Hmm. I'm going to read through today's affirmation once, and then I'll invite you to stand and join me. I say yes to a world that works for all. Free of fear and anchored in faith, I walk boldly forward in love, accepting myself and others with an open heart. Please stand and join me with conviction. I say yes to a world that works for all. Free of fear and anchored in faith, I walk boldly forward in love, accepting myself and others with an open heart. When I was a little girl, my mother had this amazing skirt. It was a circle skirt, and it was like T-length, they used to call it, just below the cap. And it was black with big white polka dots. I loved this skirt. And this skirt said mother to me. Now, it came to pass that when I was five or six years old, right around there, one day, my mother was driving myself and my siblings and a bunch of neighbor kids in the family station wagon to the beach. We lived in Hoquim, and we were on that stretch of road, if you know that part of the state, between Hoquim and Ocean Shores. And the station wagon was stuffed with kids. Like, this was before seat belts and car seats. It's like, I don't know, there were eight or nine kids in that car. And we were actually in the back, back part of the station wagon. I was with some of the kids. And we were bouncing up and down on the inner tubes <laughs> because we were so excited to get to the beach. And the poor kids who had to sit in the back seat, you know, we felt really sorry for them because we were obviously in the good place. And something happened that I don't actually remember. The next thing I remember is the car was upside down. And there were voices calling to us. And it was very like, what happened? And I became frightened, in fact, terrified. And there was broken glass. And I was looking at my siblings and my friends around me, and everybody had blood. And, what? What? I could not make sense of what I was seeing. And I began to put things back together, and I heard someone calling me to come to the window of the car, and I remember crawling and kind of being pulled along 
by somebody, I don't know who, and crawling out the car of the window into the arms, the, the window of the car, upside down, squished, like crawling, right, this, and into the arms of someone who pulled me up and set me on my feet and turned back to whoever was coming out next. I was terrified. I had no idea what was going on. No idea. The idea of car accident, I don't think had ever even entered my consciousness, right? And I wanted my mom. And I turned and I looked and I saw a black skirt with white polka dots. And I flung myself around my mother's legs and I was sobbing. And I was like, mommy, mommy. And someone patted me on the back and said, it's okay, honey. And it was not my mother. The voice wasn't right. And even the pat wasn't quite right. And I realized that the skirt wasn't even quite right. It was close. <laughs> and I was horrified. And I remember kind of stepping back and looking up into this stranger's face and her saying to me something like, I mean, these are her words, I don't know the words, but the communication was, I will take you to your mother. And I flung myself around her legs again <laughs> and was sobbing. And indeed, she took me to my mother who was over somewhere nearby, sitting on the ground, bleeding. I'm reliving it here for just a moment. It was a horrifying experience. I had been traumatized. I went for what I thought was comfort. And it wasn't what I thought. <laughs> it wasn't who I thought. I needed my mom. And when I realized it wasn't my mom, I took what I could get, didn't I? And I believed in her comforting words that she would take me to my mother. And indeed she did, and even more amazing in some ways, is suddenly my dad was there. He hadn't been with, I, and I remember just feeling amazed, like, where did he come from? And you know, we were probably 20 minutes, 25 minutes out of town, and someone had gone into town. We didn't have cell phones then, right? <laughs> Car seats or cell phones. Somebody had driven into town, he taught at the local high school, and had probably picked him up and brought him out, and my dad was there. And I was so comforted. I'm looking around my sister, and you know, everybody was fine. We had a lot of bumps and bruises and scratches and scrapes, and my one sister lost one of her teeth. But everybody was okay, and aren't we blessed? And when I looked around and I saw my family, and I saw my mother, and I saw my dad, I knew it was gonna be okay. This is Metaphor Sunday. That, too, is a metaphor. Think about it a little bit. See, that woman in the polka dot skirt, she did the right thing, didn't she? She saw a child in need, and she comforted me. And she took me to my mom. And somebody got in their car and drove to the high school and got my dad and brought my dad to the place where we were. People did the right and moral thing, and what I want to invite you today to do in your life is to become the woman in the polka dot skirt. To do the right thing. To be the presence of love, even for those who do not belong to you. Even for those who do not belong to you. Even for those who might appear to be different from you because that is the right thing. That is the thing that is anchored in the love of God, the presence, the energetic, from which we came, which loved us enough to create us and to put us on this planet to teach us to love one another more fully. Can you be the woman in the polka dot skirt? Can I be the woman in the polka dot skirt?
We sharpen our swords a lot in this teaching. And I want to say that there is nothing wrong with sharpening swords. We need sharp swords. It's also the truth that we need to cut some brush. <clears throat> and we need to cut brush with our sharp swords, not with our hands, not with our dull blades, but with our sharp swords. The woman in the polka dot skirt had a pretty sharp sword, pretty strong mother instinct, whatever, an ability to love a child that wasn't hers, to comfort her and to make sure she got to her mother and to her father and that her needs got met. What a beautiful thing that is. I need to become, in a bigger way, the woman in the polka dot skirt. Now, Sharif Abdullah, in um, our chapter for this week, tells us there are three ways that we must practice to become that healing presence. He says those three ways are to practice enoughness, compassion, and connection. Enoughness, compassion, and connection. To become the woman in the polka dot skirt every day of our lives, not just in a crisis. It's good to be the woman in the polka dot skirt in a crisis. But we have fewer crises if we be her every day. To become her, we must practice enoughness, compassion, and connection. And then we can put our sharp swords to work, cutting a clear path to the good that everyone deserves. So let's talk first about enoughness. He says in here, I love how he, he, said, he, how he stated this. He said, you know, our, in our society, most of us have either been scarred by scarcity or spoiled by luxury. We don't know what is enough. We either don't have enough or we have too much. We have a challenging time walking the middle path of enough. How much is enough? And let me tell you where it starts. I am enough. If I know that I am enough, I don't need to get, 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 get. I need only to get that which provides me with enough. And then those who are in that experience of scarcity can also have enough because I'm not hoarding the enoughness. I am enough. I have enough. And that kind of begs the question for me, how much is enough? And I want to read, it's Metaphor Sunday, I'm telling you. I'm going to read to you another metaphor that Sharif Abdullah shares with us on page 155. He says, assume you are the leader of a tribe of 800 people. You are meeting with the head of another tribe, also with 800 people. You are discussing a well that is large enough to reliably and sustainably supply water to about 2,000 people per day. 800, 800, the water supports 1,600. We got 2,000, we have enough in excess. The universe is like that. This is a win-win scenario. Both tribes can win. And so can the world, without taxing the regenerative capacity of the well. What if the leader of the other tribe decides he wants all of the water? He wants to bottle the excess and sell it to other tribes, including yours. He also wants the right to expand his tribe and keep all of the water. He has guns. Instantly, your two tribes are in conflict. The conflict is not one of resources. The amount of water in the well has not changed. The problem is not a lack of water, but a clash of concepts. Your concept of enoughness is in conflict with his. You see, it is true what we teach. We live in an abundant universe, and there is enough for everyone. Yes? If we can rest in having enough, everyone can have enough.
be the woman in the polka dot skirt. I am enough. I have enough. I am enough. I have enough. And do you see how that's a movement in consciousness? Yes? So what we're talking about here is building that healing consciousness. The three practices of a healer is a process of building a healing consciousness, knowing that I am enough. And so, no matter how much I have, it's enough. The second practice of a healer, he says, is compassion. Love. You see, compassion... Compassion is the act of love. Yes, they always say love is a verb. I don't think so. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's compassion. Compassion is the thing that is actually how we act out love in the world. We have compassion for others. When I was standing outside the car bleeding and crying for my mother, and I flung my arms around this strange woman's legs, and I was so horrified, what did she have for me? Compassion. She had the ability to identify with my suffering and offer me comfort, even though I belonged to someone else. She offered me comfort. She acted out love in the world. And here's the thing. I bet I was a pretty lovable five-year-old, yeah? <laughs> I'm guessing. I mean, I kind of go, <laughs> I see these pictures of me, and I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> Like, I don't know. I'm sure it was pretty easy for her in the midst of this crisis to love me, yes? We are also called to love the unlovable. Oops. We are also called to love the unlovable. You see, when we have compassion for the other, we are demonstrating what we teach. What is the central core of our teaching? One life, one power, one essence, one energy. And if I'm putting other or them out there, I am denying that spiritual truth that we are all one. I am denying that we are all created in the image and likeness. Some of us have been conditioned in a way that we forgot that. But we are all created in the image and likeness of the infinite. And when I call somebody out there the other, I'm just demonstrating that I don't really believe that, that I'm giving it lip service, but I don't really believe it. And I do that sometimes. God again. It's interesting, there has been a thing in the paper this week, I don't know if any of you read about it, there was a young woman who um, had been accepted into the Air Force and then a video surfaced of her engaging in some pretty racist conduct and expressing some very racist language. And um, people had a lot of opinions about that. And her behavior was inappropriate. It was other, right? It was a lack of compassion for other. And people are vilifying her for that. But you see, she is also one with us. She is also part of the infinite creation of God. And what we tend to do when people forget to be compassionate like she did is we kick them out and we isolate them further. And the Air Force has rescinded her entry into the Air Force. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Let's put her in that diverse environment, right? Let's put her in the Air Force. And let's give her a black woman as her commanding officer. <laughs> and let's give her some training around diversity and inclusion, which I know they do in our military. Let's hold her accountable to the commitment that she made when she signed up for the Air Force and make her serve and give her an opportunity to be included in the larger body and to be loved, to have some compassion for her. You see, when we behave in these ways of excluding others, we're just acting out our pain and our belief in separation. She's just acting out her pain in an inappropriate way, her belief in separation in an inappropriate way, and now let's hold her feet to the fire and put her in the military, by golly. 
Because therein lies healing, including her, loving her, having compassion for what she did and the pain that she must be in to behave in that way heals. That's the healing consciousness. What do we do with people who forget to be compassionate and they commit crimes or they harm people? We isolate them further. We put them in prison. Or gated communities. Yes? We isolate further when we forget to be compassionate or we isolate others further. And I'm not saying don't hold people accountable for the things that they do. Absolutely. We need to hold people accountable for the things that they do that do not support the greater society. But you know what? There are ways to do that that are compassionate and loving and embody that consciousness of healing. When we isolate those who are expressing a lack of compassion. We are ignoring their pain. Now imagine if I had been standing by that car crying for my mother and someone ignored my pain. We would think, ah, she's so mean. She totally ignored that little girl. We do the same thing. They're just not as lovable as little five-year-old me was. It's easy to love those who are lovable. But compassion asks us to connect with the human inside the monster. Compassion asks us to remember the spiritual truth that we're all one, and that we're here to learn and to become all that God would have us be. Can you embody that consciousness? Can you practice being the woman in the polka dot skirt? And the third practice that Sharif Abdullah encourages us to engage in is the practice of connection. And he talks about this in several ways. He talks about connecting with ourselves, our inner self, knowing who we are, what we want. He talks about connecting with place, where we have been placed in the world. I had a wonderful meditation this morning around this idea. I was just in my office right there, and I thought, you know, I blessed this place, all that stuff, but I haven't really ever, in the five months I've been here, just sat here and appreciated this 100 square feet and blessed every inch of it and been present to it. And I did that this morning, and I have a whole different feeling about my space back there. You see, being present and connected to my space, I feel more anchored, more grounded, more appreciative of what's been given me in terms of space to do my job in. So yes, I connect internally with me, I connect with place, I connect with others through my practice of compassion. That's how I give love feet, right? And I must connect with the divine, the divinity within me. I had this great experience the other week. Um, I had for a few weeks been turning my car on and every once in a while it wouldn't start. And I'm like, what? Because then it would start. And I'm going like this because of my age. I don't have a key, I push a start button. <laughs> I don't know why, it could be because of my age. Um, so I'm pushing and nothing's happening. And then they say, if nothing's happening, you put your key fob up against it and push with the key fob and it's supposed to start then. Well, it wasn't. But if I would do it like 8, 10, 12, 14 times, eventually it would start, right? Well, so I did this like for a few weeks, and then I was like, okay, girlfriend, if you don't do something about this, you're probably going to really get stuck. So I went down to the car place, and I was like, here's what's happening. And they fixed it, and when I came out, he said, you know what? One of the cells was empty in your battery. And I'm like, oh, batteries have cells. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> But he said it was only one, all the others were fine. I don't know how many cells are in my car battery, but um, <laughs> I, these things escape me. But my point is, it was interesting to me as I was driving away to think only one cell was empty, so my car could kind of still run, right? 
The connection was happening from the other cells. It was only when my car was on that one cell that was empty that I couldn't get any oomph going and get my car started so I could go out and do my work, the work of God. If any one cell is empty, it's a little haphazard about whether you can do it or not, right? If we're not engaged with our spiritual practice, if we're not engaged with our religious, our spiritual life, if you will, that cell might be empty. And your machine may or may not start so that you can go out and be about compassion, so that you go out in the world and be about connection, so that you can go out in the world and be about demonstrating enoughness. Now, the next time you could push the button and you're good because you're connected to, you've just had a great workout, you're feeling healthy, it's like in your car goes and you can totally do it. But you never know. Every cell has to be full so that we can reliably be about God's work. So we can reliably be the woman in the polka dot skirt. So that our swords can reliably cut and we can go back and sharpen them and come back and cut some more and go back and sharpen them, check the cells in the battery. Know that we are connected to the infinite energy that is required for us to be all that God would have us be in the world. Take a deep breath with me. Can you be the woman in the polka dot skirt? Can you demonstrate enoughness? I have enough, I am enough. Can you be present to love as compassion you're doing in the world? Can you connect to something greater than you are? To place, to presence, and allow yourself to be the infinite presence as you go about your daily life. Let's turn within as we seal this message. Take the sacred breath with me. And as you breathe, Follow your breath deep, deep, deep into your heart and allow your shoulders to drop and your jaw to soften as you simply bring yourself into this moment in time connecting with the infinite heart of love that has given you life and that from which you sprang and that which is living you right here and right now, simply feel every cell and every organ and every bone and every sinew in your body to relax into the awareness. There is only one life. And that life is God's life. And that life is my life now. And as you lean into this awareness, allow yourself to declare within your heart of hearts right now, I am enough. Exactly as I am, I am enough. The gifts of God operate through me and as me. And I know this to be the spiritual truth of me. I am enough. And now simply declare within your heart of hearts, I am love. I allow the infinite loving presence of the divine to make itself known as me. I am love. And as you stand in the truth of these declarations of faith, 
Begin to feel yourself plug in to the infinite battery of all life. Allow yourself to see any cells that might be a little bit low or even empty for you and begin to recharge. And if there's anything you must do to fill those emptying cells, you simply allow that awareness to make itself known to you. And now commit in your heart of hearts to that doingness in the coming days. What you will do to reconnect, to fill those empty cells. As you declare once again, I am enough. I am love. And see yourself stepping forward into the world this week, striding confidently in your enoughness, striving confidently in your self-love and your love for others, your compassion for others. See yourself being of service. See yourself being a comfort. One who includes, not excludes. One who sees the very wholeness of the universal presence and simply allows that to unfold. And so it is in these ways that you begin to remember more fully than you ever have before who you are, what you are, who you belong to, the presence of God living itself as you. And so it's in this consciousness that we join together in the chant, the declaration of a spiritual truth. I am remembering who I am. I am remembering who I am. I remember who I am. Ah. 